Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've had time to digest and reflect on this morning's discussions. The NHS contributes at least 15% towards our national total of carbon emissions. Phase three of the public sector decarbonisation scheme was launched by Salix Finance in July this year. Salix Finance runs the SDS on behalf of the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero. Phase 3C, scheduled for 24-25, has granted additional funding of £230 million to help Trust reach their Net Zero target. This funding will allow Trust to explore and implement, where necessary, the use of heat pumps, solar panels, double glazing, low energy LED lighting, and any other solutions to drive emissions down. So to discuss how the NHS can improve its sustainability and meet its targets for 2030 and beyond, I have some expert panellists to introduce you to. They are Janet Smith, Head of Sustainability at Royal Wolverhampton NHS Foundation Trust, got Mark Beaumont, Head of Sustainability, Hull and East Yorkshire Hospitals, NHS Foundation Trust. Jason Light, Head of Sustainability and Energy at University Hospital, Southampton. I'm going to miss out NHS Foundation Trust each time. And making a second appearance of the day, Sean Jackson, Director of Estates at Birmingham Women's and Children's NHS Foundation Trust. Do remember to submit any questions and uh, I'll try to ask them once we get started. So, uh, Sean, thank you very much for joining us twice today. We feel like we're working you hard and um, <laughs> to all our other panelists we'll start off with you Sean if, if I may because uh, we were talking about retrofitting and refurbing on the last one but what PSDS projects um, have you got underway and, and, and how are they going? Yeah so we were successful in four separate bids two in 3A and two in 3B and the sort of total grant money is about 63 million quid roughly um, and then on top of that is a contribution that takes it to about 68 or so around 70. Um, so that's a Stilvelin pair site we have a, a children's mental health site that is effectively a equivalent to a small community hospital um, and that's getting air source heat pumps uh, put into that because it's um, had a recent extension it's had some insulation improvements over the years and the new extensions insulated uh, bigger than a bunker um, so it gives us the ability to put low temperature heating in there through air source um, and then we have a women's maternity hospital site that is 70 structure that um, we are recladding. We are also putting ground source borehole heat pumps into it because we have a lovely aquifer 200 and meters down uh, that is got endless amounts of flow out of it, which is absolutely brilliant because all the breweries have stopped using it in Birmingham and wider areas. Um, although they have licenses for extraction, um, they're not using it, which means that actually um, it's got a really good replenishment rate. Um, and um, and then at the We've also got a mixture of air handling and other things, improvements in, in the mixture of that. But then at the Children's Hospital, we've got ground source borrow heat pumps again um, with cladding, windows, BMS, and um, a little bit of sort of more detailed sort of heat emitter improvements, etc. But um, yeah, quite a, quite a mixed bag of bits and bobs going on. And then there is, on, what I would say is that the PSDS stuff hasn't stopped us there it's sort of promoted like the environmental improvements across the trust you know we've got solar and ecdc fans going in and things that you would like to have done anyways but the larger schemes created a bit more i don't know enthusiasm to get on with the smaller stuff i love the way you call it bits and bobs and you've got 68 million at your disposal <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a good start thank you for keeping us off with that mark i know you were successful in phase one of the psds um what challenges do you face and 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 how's it all going your end uh yeah we were we not quite as uh at large as sean's uh, as success we got 12.6 million in phase one so we did things uh, of a similar ilk, we replaced uh, 16 gas-fired boilers with air source heat pumps. Uh, we've installed uh, a couple of four pipe systems now, so one off the back of phase one, and we've done a, a further one uh, more recently, obviously learning from what we did in the in phase one. Um, I think some of the challenges we've had uh, back then, it was during COVID, so supplier issues, getting equipment to site uh, was a real challenge. Uh, another thing is, I think, working with estates colleagues to make sure they're on board with which, with this new technologies around heat pumps, which 
although there's, there's some similarities to AC systems, it's it's different for them to get involved with. And when you're retrofitting into old buildings that are anywhere from early 1900s to um, more recent ones, there's some challenges to overcome when you, you come to retrofit that and either have to change the existing heating systems over uh, and they have to learn those things. So there's been, um, there's been a big learning progress around the use of heat pumps and how they how they deliver heat to the estate um some of the bits that were really positive like how pv and pv field we managed to uh, we're very fortunate we have a lot of land near one of our hospitals so we could put five megawatts of solar pv in which has been massive for us um not only in supplying like a third of the electricity for that site and allowing it to to go completely off grid during the daytime in the summer but also just it's created a lot of interest around sustainability and given that platform to be able to talk about what we what we're doing uh, and work with local universities um, and local organizations to to do more work around net zero yeah i think as well when you see the solar panels you, you can actually see it rather than a lot of the changes you guys on this panel discussion we're making aren't visible to the naked eye and i think people can get enthused when they see things like that working very well jason let's bring you into the conversation in southampton how is your journey going so far yes yeah, so um i think we we're at a, quite a pivotal point about a year ago so we had a 23 year old contract for energy really old um steam driven system um, so I would control. Wow. Yeah, I mean, my, I, you speak to a lot of trusts that they've got old steam systems. Um, so we uh, were very fortunate to um, access just over 29 million from Salix in, in round 3B. Um, we aligned that with a procurement process. Um, so we've, we've procured an energy partner all the way up to 2040 in line with the net zero targets. Um, so the funding's been used for the first couple of years capital round similar to to um sean and mark were talking about um with uh you know boiler replacements to heat pumps solar carports cladding um one of our large buildings um bit of led and things like that um i think and as you say a lot of this is kind of behind the curtain you can't see any of it so we've we've got about three oh well probably five kilometers of steam pipe being replaced by low temperature wow. pipe work. Um, and, you know, no one's going to see that. It'd be either buried in the ground or in the steam pits, but um, I'm incredibly excited about it because um, <laughs> it will make a huge difference both to our our maintenance budgets, um, which are obviously incredibly stretched at the moment, but the efficiency to that from both the old kit being replaced and, and putting more efficient lower temperature systems in place um and it, it tees up for some of the more exciting stuff we might want to look at in future that sean was talking about with geothermal and stuff i feel very privileged to hear what you're doing because you know it is easy to think isn't it when we're all worried about the climate crisis that oh not enough's happening it's not happening quickly but i do like to have an insight in these conferences because it, it always blows my mind really what you guys are up to behind the scenes and how much a difference you're making jonathan you can see electric vehicles in the um, ambulance service how are you doing on that front have you introduced them yet and why is it important for your service to introduce the electric vehicles to try and meet your targets well, being the ambulance service, the bulk of our missions actually come from the vehicles rather than from our estate. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why we, we didn't get any of the PSDS funding because we, we found that we weren't eligible to apply for it, which is a little bit frustrating yeah. because um, it would have been nice to have had some, some assistance with, with installing some of the infrastructure. Um, but, but despite that, we have made some progress. Um, so, so we need to get down the emissions from the fleet because they account for 85 percent of our carbon footprint um do they really wow 85 percent 85 percent of the emissions that we directly control yeah. this is so hugely important that we we do this um otherwise we're not going to meet our emissions targets so what we've done is we, we've very much focused on the, the the easy wins to begin with so working within our existing capacity the electrical capacity um we, we've exhausted that now so we've, we've got 48 charges have gone in now um and we are acquiring electric vehicles we've been testing um rapid response vehicles as well to see how they perform in the field and we're trying to get hold of a couple of the uh 
electric DCA prototypes so that we can start collecting data on, on how they perform in the field as well. So, so we're very much am making progress in this area and uh, we hope it's going to accelerate going forward. Fantastic. Um, Janet, you've been sitting there very patiently. So I'd, I'd love to ask you to update us on what's going on at Wolverhampton, but also to talk to you about the importance of data and, and whether you're embracing data in trying to reduce your carbon emissions. Yes, um, like everyone else in the panel, we were quite lucky to actually get some funding as well from uh, Salix uh, for the PSDS. So the trust actually managed to secure 74 million, but, wow. um, but 32 million of that was actually um, a system-wide system -wide bid, which means it's for the whole of the block country. We did have a share of it and the others as well. So, so that's one thing uh, in terms of what we are um, what we have implemented, of course, we have um, our solar farm as well, all 31 acres of it, which should provide as about eight um, megawatts of uh, of uh, electricity and uh, will supply two quarters of what we currently have. And yeah. other than that, we also, of course, replaced our incinerator, which is providing us with two megawatts of energy as well. So. There's um, other, the same with the others, we're also installing um, heat pumps. But uh, what's important is that we're also making sure that we're addressing the, um, the fabric of the building because it is very important um, because it needs, um, especially windows, making sure that you're actually airtight. That's one thing. The other thing is making sure insulations are in place, making sure that the roof are actually better so that the technology that we choose to put in it, whether it's air source heat pumps or another technology, it actually works and it it um, gives what it needs, the benefit that it is intended to give. Other thing in terms of data, data is very important to us because it allowed us to then determine and plan accordingly on how we're going to actually transition our current estate. So data is important because the condition of it, the backlog liabilities, um, the things that we could, we could actually, the technology that we can put in there because not all um, buildings are the same. The build are not the same. We have old, um, old workhouse buildings that we need then to, to decide whether do we actually retrofit it or is it better to to actually build new and if we if we retrofit it what level does it need to be and that's all driven by data um driven by uh data on the services actually that are in those buildings and also the conditions of the of the structure and the usage of it there it, it informs the, the whole infrastructure program and also very importantly, it let us know whether it is actually going to be climate resilient. Because at the end of the day, we're not only talking about net zero, COP, COP28 is actually ongoing at the moment. And one of the big uh, talking points, of course, climate change and the NHS uh, estate needs to be climate resilient once we reach 24 say and that's where the challenge can we actually do it yeah that's actually a question i should have asked in the first panel about the new hospitals making sure that you know they're going to be resilient for you know for the our changes in weather etc that no doubt are going to continue um sean you know trusts are busy um everybody's busy doing their jobs how do you sell sustainability and um and, and engage people so they feel you know right behind you don't call it always sustainability. Don't call it always net it. zero. Match it to your audience. So if you're going to go speak to the CFO, you want to know about finance. You might have an interest because you've got an electric car and you had a quick chat about solar and the rest of it. But talk to it in their language. Um, if I pitch up at the trust board and say, well, I want to do loads of green investment, but there's 
a good chance that it'll just cost the same money that it did before. And I don't know what will happen in the future with electricity and gas and all the markets in there. They'll say, well, we're trying to deal with patient backlogs and all the rest of it. But if I go ahead and say, actually, um, currently the women's hospital that I've got, I can't guarantee the temperature in the delivery suite rooms, which means that when mother has a baby, um, she can't always have skin to skin um, as the, you know, straight after birth which is one of the most pivotal moments in birth and um you know then they're going to say what can we do to fix it and i say well actually there's some funding available we could go and bid for that it'll mean i'll have to do these things as well and then we move on um and we also go in to talk about you know when as janet said about data it's backlog a lot of this this is backlog this is things that we'd normally do um, and should be doing if we had better backlog budgets. We've replaced boilers just with something else. <laughs> um, it, you know, we've replaced um, fabric of buildings with a better fabric. Um, you know, we've updated lighting. These are just life cycle things um, that we're na naturally doing. Um, it's just managed under a different angle. So I think always going net zero because there's always a pessimist there's always you know somebody that might have a different view against it but never go with just one angle of approach of net zero i'm going to reduce my carbon because a lot of people will say well i don't care about that what about geopolitics of carbon and all the rest of it if you go along and you know associate with something that's going to make a real direct difference to something that they care about then it you know can go that way so really i think the test that i always put uh to my teams when we're working on this is would I have been doing this anyways without net zero, without sustainability, without the carbon? Because then them bits are a bonus rather than yeah. the necessity mm -hmm. of the core of it. And you know, if somebody come along and said, actually like solar panels, some people say, Mail, oh, they're a luxury, why are we spending money on them? Well, if somebody come along and said you can make a guaranteed return on investment in six point eight uh, years or 10 years depending on where you're doing it and total investment and land etc snap your hand off <laughs> uh, which because that means reduction in revenue which means that you can guarantee that you can hire nurses for the next 10 years and pay for the drugs that they need to as well um so etc etc you know it's it's that sort of don't just take one angle and you know don't always rely on that you have to measure 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 everything that you're doing um you know take reference of other people that are doing things and copy their elements because they'll have much more credibility than a consultant written report if you say well these four trusts have already done this can i copy and paste it and then what will generally happen is whoever's at the top of your table you see a 4 a chief exec they'll go and have a chat with their equivalents and say how did it go for you and i know that happened because the cfo told me you know that he went and spoke to the other trust that had done the similar thing and he said yeah it was all right that yeah that was really the clinch that made the decision on that element of it not my 100 page report that i sent in you know yeah. um so it's yeah. all in the selling isn't it i i agree exactly. with you that i identify with that um mark how have the solutions that you've implemented um performed so far um once you got everything going i uh, yeah, could I just add on yeah, to sure. John's point a little? I, I yeah. agree with uh, with everything he said. I think we're all, certainly I'm seeing a change in perception and acceptance around net zero and sustainability. So people are a lot more accommodating to it. But um, there's still that barrier that people see green sustainability net zero as being a cost burden, as opposed to potentially a lot of the projects can deliver cost savings. And we had a similar thing with our CFO. It was a case of, well, how much is that cost us doing that? And it's it's actually, well, that's actually delivered a saving. So starting to build that evidence that a lot of this work, uh, we whether it's in the States or the wider elements, can actually deliver um, financial savings, um, a better working environment, uh, improved health and safety all at the same time. So it's, like Sean said, a win-win uh, on multiple fronts that you, you get in and changing that perception away from this is going to be a cost to us, I think is something that's key that to push that message. Um, come back to how things have performed. I think we were fortunate for a lot of the measures, fabric improvements, you know, you get, they just, they sit there and they just work. I think the, the areas where we've had um, that haven't, have, we've struggled with are some of the heat pumps, getting them working correctly. Um, 
a lot of that we've managed to resolve with education and working with the installers just to get things set up and uh, returning for commissioning where things have gone maybe slightly awry. Uh, that was only probably 20% of the systems we, we installed. Most of them have worked quite effectively. Uh, we've recently had an issue with a step up unit, but again, that's more of a mechanical thing than um, a system design point of view. Uh, again, some of this technology uh, people are still getting used to, and there's not as many providers locally that can work on some of the systems. Uh, so it has taken a bit more work. Things like the PV, they've kind of exceeded our expectations of what we expected. And financially, uh, as Sean mentioned, due to the time when we installed it, um, delivered a, a, a great revenue saving, which again, helps to keep our finance team happy that this kind of stuff is is taking us in the right direction. And yeah, they've been our biggest areas of, I, I guess the heat pumps have been the area of challenge, but also now that they're, they're operating well, people are starting to get, to get used to them. Yeah, good, good to hear. Jonathan, a question um, for you from Zoe. Uh, Zoe says, what support do ambulance trusts need to reach the targets for net emission ambulances? And how challenging are these targets going to be? Well, I think that the real support that we need is to help with the upfront cost of upgrading the estate. Um, obviously, there's two sides to this. There's one hand, there's money to pay for the fleet upgrade, but that could be part of the actual ongoing process of just acquiring new vehicles each year and making sure that the new vehicles that we buy, especially from 2027 onwards, have to be electric. So that's one half of the equation. But the other half is making sure that our estate can actually accommodate the electric vehicles. And we know that running electric vehicles is going to save us an awful lot of money. Um, and, and, it, and it comes back to the, the arguments that, that Sean was alluding to about the financial benefits of doing a lot of this. So um, NHS England have calculated that if we switch to electric fleets, we're going to be saving £59 million a year across the NHS, which is a huge amount of money that can go into other services then. Um, but what we do need, though, is help with that upfront cost, which um, NHS England estimates is going to be £100 million to, to upgrade the electrical infrastructure. And the, you can see with that £100 million investment for £59 million a year saving, it's actually a really, really good deal, and we're going to be benefiting down the line um, considerably. But we still need that bit of assistance with getting over the hump with that initial investment, um, especially when we have, say, short-term financial constraints. It makes it quite difficult to to argue for that money, uh, and that's really where we're stuck at. I think just getting over where that. Is that where is that money going to come from, Jonathan? Do you think? Well. It would have to come from central government in terms of some yeah. sort of settlement to say, well, we need to put this money into the estate um, and then that's going to then generate these long term savings. Uh, and so that money will come back quite quickly within two or three years. So so that there, there is that argument to be had, I think, at a higher level to actually support the, the, the trusts with, with making this transition. It feels like you've kind of just slightly been forgotten there because that seems a no-brainer to me. So it's a shame you haven't already got the funding to do that. Yes. <laughs> yes, good. That'll do. I'm going to bring Jason back into the conversation yeah. now. Um, Jason, when you go, I just wondered if what Sean um, was talking about resonated with you. When, when you go in to do your sustainability sell, is it all in how you sell it and, and the, the wording you use to get the support you need? Um, well, I, I don't do it. So I, do. Um, I, I often say my role is a facilitator as the head of sustainability within the hospital. Um, we, we have, a, I understand, a fairly unique model that our sustainability is led by our chief medical officer. Um, oh, interesting. It's quite often said that the, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and it absolutely is. Um, we've got thousands of health professionals in the hospital who are incredibly passionate about care and, and um, have a brilliant understanding of science as well. So, you know, it's it, the appreciation nationally just to the general population is, is kind of 97 percent um, concern for climate to some extent. So it's, it's, I suspect it's higher within the NHS. Um, so our focus is very much taking it from the clinical position so everything we're doing with the states is 
is related has a direct correlation with that um i have a clinical and environmental sustainability lead who's a respiratory um consultant so um myself and him quite often do a double act and we always joke we're kind of like ant and deck and we kind of turn up into walks and we have discussions with teams so that he can speak the language he's part of their community on the clinical side um he's respected and um i can talk to them about how that fits from the environmental and broader sustainability so um it's very much about empowering people and getting as many people as possible to engage with the program and and support them because they've got brilliant ideas and a lot of passion and and drive so it's finding ways to kind of bring that together and quite often what we we might talk to one team and they're they're saying oh i've got this issue in this area we can't deal with this um and you find out that's right across the hospital or um because of we're very multidisciplinary across sustainability we i'll be working with the, the it department on something else so we can bring those connections in so it's a, it's actually where we're so ch challenging climate at the moment with budgets and and and, and all sorts of issues yeah. um it's it's one kind of positive area where we're able to kind of engage right across the organization and, and I'm, people I'm seem to a whole new I'm seeing a whole new show, ITV show coming on. I'm a sustainability manager. <laughs> Get me out of here. Hosted, <laughs> hosted by you and your colleague. Uh, <laughs> Janet Lunick has published, obviously, the Net Zero Estates Delivery Plan, the Net Zero Building Standard. <laughs> what challenges do, do they pose to the work you're trying to get on with? Oh, I've lost your sound, Janet. Hang on, let's fix your sound. No let's worries. Um, I think there I'm you are. Now. Sorry about that. Um, yes, uh, the the net zero estates delivery plan has very specific deliverables, and one of them actually is like metering both your um, electric and water. And there's specific ask as well about training, and and um, I don't know with the others, but in terms of like metering, that is actually quite a huge challenge because at the moment our the ask is to to get metering down to the level of departments. But at the moment, our metering is very hodgepodge. We got um, building level, we have floor level, we have some of them site level. So that would require a lot of investments and a lot of investigation as well on how we're gonna, how we gonna approach it. Uh, in terms of the ask about training, um, training um, staff, current staff, especially for us because our AFM is actually in-house. So which means we have to backfill uh, any of those uh, if we want to take them out to training and particularly for the new technologies as well because the reality is we need to be able to maintain and also um, perform reactive maintenance on those. So there are a lot of, a lot of challenges that it presents and uh, and the issue, and like what the others have, have actually um, alluded to, is that there is, an you know, Jonathan did say about it, that there is actually no resource. It's not the whole of the net zero agenda is barely resourced by the national level. So it is then for us within the trust to try and see how we can resource it. And, and that's where the biggest challenge is. With regards to the to the um, natural building standards, it asks us to actually look at embodied carbon of new builds or even major refurb. At the same time, operational carbon and end of life carbon. At the moment, it's not really something that that um, the the skills to do that and also the supply chain, both both upstream and downstream is not ready to, to produce it or to, to actually provide the data that you require to, to, um, to pull those information together. So that's where the challenge is. And, and um, the design teams and, and everything has a lot of things to, to learn as well. So it, it is, I don't know with the others, whether that's, um, they see it as a challenge, but that is one of the things that, that we still have to navigate. Sean, do you want to pick up on, on that? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of things in there. Um, 
but I'd, I'd sympathise with Janet um, with the market, the metering, and the rest of the things. It, it's very NHS. I mean, of all the compliments, because I spent 15 years working in the NHS, um, that we try to get data, we give instructions to find your data, find every detail about everything you're doing so we can form a strategy. Well, if uh, Jason's thrown some so some solar in, Janet's done some solar, there's probably a good evidence base there to say that probably all of us should do some solar. Um, and, you know, and that's the same for LED lighting, ECDC fans, insulation, all the rest of it. I think we need to get out of our own like silos, as everybody is saying, and just repeat repeat what somebody else has done like if there is a business case that's been approved for uh janet and jason to throw in you know huge fields of solar panels why are we writing 10 more business cases every time we want to do some more solar panels um because you know if we do some quick mathematics um the psds rounds of funding probably had you know from the NHS alone, 200 and odd bids <laughs> per trust uh, from trusts, which probably cost them about £100,000 per bid structure to build that information and build up a case, and then probably you know another 100 to get it through its own governance structure in the trust, etc. And then we get funneled out a couple of hundred million per year to the NHS. Well, we just spent 20 odd million on writing cases about what we could all potentially do. Um, but when we've all got repeatable buildings, repeatable problems, if you go to the private sector and uh, looking at Jonathan's and said, well, if you give us 100 million, you'll get, you know, 58 million back every year for the next two years and then you'll give him some profit. I, I don't think there's anybody in the country that's going to say no to that as an investment of a, you know, two and odd year return. Um, same with LED lighting, you know, it's not a new thing. These are not new and questionable technologies. These are basic stuff and basic return on cash. Um, and I think there's really like, we just need to step back and say, rather than us all trying to gather data. And I think we, and a bit about centralization is we, uh, the, and I have real problems with the net zero instructions from central NHS and the rest, because it asks everybody to go and do everything individually, <laughs> rather than actually where we're going to pick all archetypes of every single hospital that we have. So we have a lot of Victorian, a lot of 70s, a lot of Best Buy hospitals. They're all the bloody same. They've got clinic rooms and wards in them, and they've usually got a mixture of different technologies. And But you could write 10 of them out, and that would gather 99% of what we've got. Let's just agree in a replacement of that. When we used to replace CHPs, as an example, uh, with CHPs, we didn't go out there and write a full proposal about how that would work and the technology of that. We'd go and say, oh, well, I want one that does a meg <laughs> or I want it to do two meg, um, you know, with a couple of boilers next to it. Um, rather than actually, can I have a full bespoke design of how that thing would work and then philosophize of whether it works or not. So rather than us doing it individually, I think there's a real, you know, massive opportunity missed in our size as the NHS. Um, what other organisation says that it's got 220 odd, if not more, directors of estates and 220 odd heads of sustainability? None <laughs> uh, is probably yeah. the answer. So there's a mass of knowledge there. And, you know, you only need one or two individuals within them, 200 and odd of people to do something amazing, which is obviously we've got a number of people on the panel here that have done stuff amazing to copy that. Why is that again? We spend so much money in prelims and pre-construction. I, you know, I think the there's reports come out now that most construction projects, fifty percent is fees. Imagine yeah, if you cut out really that pre-construction really fee, <laughs> uh, yeah. where because you just copied it because we actually we've got one down the road that looks the same and we're just doing it again. I'm just going to. I am slight a couple of minutes over, and we have got a speaker, but I just wanted to end with Mark really to just ask what advice you might give um, for someone preparing um, a bid for PSDS. I I think that somewhat dependent on what level of internal skill sets you have so for some organizations they may have the skill sets internally to be able to build those bids 
Uh, for others, if you haven't, then it's a case of engaging with consultants and making sure you do that early ahead of the funding rounds. Uh, obviously, there is the Low Carbon Skills Fund, which helps people to be able to put together some of the, the detailed designs, the decarbonisation work to enable those further bids uh, to be put in. So for organisations that are uh, limited with some of that resource, that's a route that's definitely worth, you know, having to put into a plan, but you know, you need to bid in the the April round for the Low Carbon Skills Fund to get that money to maybe look at putting a bid into the PSDS in the following years, kind of uh, October round for the PSDS. So I think planning and uh, gathering data, as uh, Sean said, if, if we can, if you can get the same examples from other organizations, it's something we've talked about regionally as well how you know at some of those meetings how do we share that information because like you said it's the same information where all churning out a subtly different report on the same types of building stock so how do we streamline that to make it easier for all of us and particularly for those organizations that maybe don't have the funding or resource to be able to put a bid in uh, and to try and get some of this funding Brilliant. I'm going to end on those wise, wise words, um, wise words and interesting comments from all of you today. So thank you to our panelists, to Janet, Mark, David, Sean and Jason for joining us. And uh, thank you to you for being with us so far. Time now to hear from Mark Maffey, architect from NHS Solent Foundation Trust. So please welcome Mark to your screens. Hello, Helen. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, uh, my name's Mark, Mark Maffey. I'm a, an architect uh, and project manager, um, better known really as the bloke from estates. Um, I've spent the last 20 odd years working in and around uh, estates departments. Um, next slide, please, if I may. Um, what I want to talk to you about, uh, sorry, next slide after that, please, if that's all right. Uh, so currently working for Solent NHS. What I want to talk to you about today is, a, sorry, if we can go back one, um, is a a project uh, that uh, I did for the Teenage Cancer Trust at Southampton General Hospital. And the subject of this talk um, is about asking the right questions. Um, if I can have the next slide, please, the one with the green on it. Yeah, the one after that, if that's all right, please. Thank you. So quick, quick bit of background. Every day, so seven young people in our country um, who are diagnosed with cancer. Uh, the Teenage Cancer Trust uh, opted to 100% fund a new inpatient uh, unit at Southampton General and this creates a separate environment for 16 to 24 year olds um, who kind of fall outside of the normal brackets really they're either treated on paediatric wards alongside cots or often find themselves on uh, wards where the uh, average age is much older. There were This was the 26th unit we did in the UK or rather the Teenage Cancer Trust did in the UK, and it was the first uh, to be designed by an NHS estates team uh, in-house. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give us a bit of location, Southampton General Hospital, the space that was allocated was what was formerly known as C6 Ward. Uh, you can see highlighted there on the corner of West Wing uh, and Level C. Uh, next slide, please. So when I embarked on this, despite what um, you might feel about yourself, uh, it occurred to me that I was uh, uh, at least twice the age of the, of the people I was designing the unit for. And however you may feel about the fact that you don't age, um, the reality is um, you need to kind of take a slight look at yourself and actually get advice from the people you are actually designing for. And that's the topic really that we're going to run through. Um, next slide, please. And so I was kind of listening to some music and a lyric came up. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's listed here. And this occurred to me, this is precisely what clinicians do. I've spent 20 years in and around clinicians, and this is what they do. If their patient needs something, they give it to them in a very kind of simple, uh, natural kind of way. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we did was then say, well, we need a vision for our project, something we can hang our, our, our approach on. And it was very simple. It was that the unit must wrap the patients with the things they need most. Um, and also we felt that the unit had to be as good as the nursing team that cared for these patients. The care these patients were getting was exemplary, but the space they were currently being cared in wasn't. And we wanted to be, if you like, as good as our clinical colleagues. Next slide, please. 
So how do we consult? How do we consult with this group of young people? So a group of uh, teenagers and young adults were put together and we kind of sort of embarked on how, how does one consult? And if we show the next slide, you'll see my uh, response to that, which is actually there is only one way, is actually to sit down and really properly listen. And it's a skill, I think, that um, sometimes time um, takes away from us, I think, um, in, in certain circumstances. Uh, next slide, please. So there's nine, nine kind of topic areas I'm going to bounce across very, very quickly. Um, this is just, I'm just sort of skimming the surface really of the things we did and the topics we discussed. Um, first thing was really about the context of the meetings. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, um, we, the meetings did not take place in the hospital in the day with me dashing around in a shirt and tie, rushing between meetings. We met in the evenings, we met over food and we met often. And that would be my advice to anyone who's undertaking something of this ilk. Um, we were supported by the kind of key workers, the Teenage Cancer Trust and Click Sergeant were, were in the process as well with us. Um, several meetings. We This process, design process, was it took about, about a year and we were meeting three every three weeks, sometimes fortnightly. And the idea of more and more meetings is that actually you really get to know each other. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we didn't start by putting a drawing in front of these uh, young people and saying, what do you think? We, uh, this is, in fact, the first drawing we tabled. And it said, what's happened to you? And the first few discussions were simply talking to the young people about the journeys they had. No two of those journeys were the same. No, two, no completely different experiences, different, different types of cancer, different treatment regimes. So, you know, it's one thing to hear the words, but it's actually about listening to the stories and really feeling that, really imagining what that would be like if it kind of happened to you or heaven forbid one of your own your own children. And don't be afraid to ask. I think that's the other thing. And I think that's something, again, I learned through this process of working with uh, with these young people that they are, you know, they're more than willing to, to tell their story if someone is prepared to listen. Uh, next slide, please. And so then we moved into what we call the likes and dislikes. And this is just a very quick snapshot of a whole host of images we kind of we just rolled in front of the young people. Some of these are previous uh, extracts from previous Teenage Cancer Trust units, some aren't. Um, we were trying to establish, you know, do you like seeing the bed head? Do you want that covered as has been done in this unit? Uh, you can see in the central photograph or not in the sketches we were kind of just doing, trying to understand the kind of look and the feel. Is it a paediatric feel? Is it a grown up mature feel? When, you know, what's that kind of, what's that 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 feel you were after um and the next slide um we started to cherry pick some of these out so this is this is the grown-ups designing a pediatric bedroom and saying well we need to put you up bed because you know the parent needs to be in the space and the young people looked at this and said well, that's great it's really practical but actually when there's no one there and it's folded away you're looking at a box on the wall and that box is telling you you are on your own um in some ways, one of them said, I'd rather it wasn't there. I'd rather you just put up a Z bed and then, and then took it away. Um, and the next slide um, was it was in, in some ways more telling because um, if we can see the next slide, the uh, on the left, this was a bathroom uh, with a, you know, a, an IPS unit completely mirrored, very kind of funky piece of design. And one of the young ladies said, I really don't like that. She said, I really don't like that because I don't always wish to look at myself. You know, I want the choice whether I see myself, depending on where I am in my treatment. And the image on the right uh, was the same. One of the other young ladies in the group said, that makes me quite uncomfortable um, because of the hairdryer. She said, there are moments in my treatment where I have no hair and I don't want to be reminded of that um, by, you know, by you know, someone thinking they're kind of helping me, but not. You know, I want people to talk to me and ask me what I want and don't want. If we can look at the next slide, please. Um, we then <clears throat> talked about this idea of driving emotions into plan. And I was able to share a story of an experience that I'd had of, uh, of losing uh, an unborn child at the hospital I was working at, at the same time uh, that I was designing the neonatal unit. And talking with the clinicians, they said, Mark, you know, in, in healthcare, we do what we can. We do the absolute best. But sometimes life is a lottery. Sometimes it's a game of snakes and ladders. You roll a six and you land on a snake. You roll a one and you land on a ladder. And it was actually that gave me the hook I needed to drive that idea, this idea of a kind of a 
kind of something around the sort of chance that happens into this design. And there's just one example of saying, look, you can take these experiences that you have and drive them, put them into your interior design, give it meaning. And that's what I was kind of drawing out these young people as to how we might do that. And if I can see the next slide, please. We talked about colour. Now, again, there's lots of views about colour. There's lots of colour theory about what different colours mean. But actually, I said to the young people, what do you think? You know, what does it say to you? And it was very, very interesting because they saw colour quite differently. If, if you were used to being in and around hospitals all the time, we're desensitised. But they said, if you go into a consulting room and in the corner there's a sharp spin, it's bright yellow with purple writing on it. You know, your first glance, you think it's you know, got some nuclear waste in it. Chemotherapy as a drug, if ever you've ever seen that, uh, in certain cases is very brightly coloured, bright red coming kind of through the tube. The nurse's uniform, matron's uniform, all of these sort of signifiers of things that are happening to you when you enter some of these spaces, which is to say many of us don't see anymore. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, we then had this big conversation about who wants what, particularly when you talk about social spaces. Again, it's easy to make assumptions that, you know, the guys will want to play pool and, and the girls will perhaps want to do something else. Um, or gaming is a kind of a boys thing. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. What do you want the furniture to be? Do you want this kind of modern slip look? Do you want something that looks like home? You know, it it's not for us to decide and impose that on you. It's for, it's for you guys to tell us what, what you want. And again, loads of conversations with all this kind of imagery. And what we did with this uh, group, because we couldn't fit it all, we had finite space, is we got them to put their own list together and then vote and then move things around and arrive at a consensus of the priorities. And we worked down that list as far as we could until we ran out of space. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we talked about artwork. This is my partner in crime, Abby, preparing for the first meeting we had with the, with the young people to talk about art. And what we did was we arrived at this meeting with some 200 odd images of artwork, not for them to pick and say, I want this one or that one, is to say, what's the style? Do you like watercolour? Do you like oil colour? Do you like photographic? Is it graffiti? Is it graphic art? Is it none of those things? Uh, and that's what we did. We turned up and we poured all these things on the table and we sat back and the next slide um, was the one of the most interesting things for me because the image that came to the top the image that triggered all of the conversation was this image of Durdle Door in a sense a national trust photograph um, because every one of the people there had an experience around this space it was a family holiday it was a school trip it triggered stories it triggered memories and the conversation moved around to the fact that what they didn't want was someone like me to say, well, here's some art and it's nighttime photos of New York or it's palm beaches on some desert island. They said, we want photographs of our area, something that is contextual to us, something we can look forward to, something we can say, actually, when I'm better, I'm going to go back here. And in this case, it was South Coast based because of the unit being being in Southampton. And that's just drove um, an important element through through the artwork. Uh, selection which we'll see in a second uh, next slide please we talked about furniture and you can see here that is are you sitting comfortably because there was this real kind of yin yang between what they wanted to see in terms of, sort of the modern aesthetic and actually some of the comfort because some of the operations they have sarcomas various other things can make life a physically uncomfortable so it's finding the right kind of furniture both in terms of look and feel and we road tested uh, we got samples, we let them check all the way through this process. And the next slide, please. And then interestingly, we talked about wallpaper because they said in the bedrooms they didn't want to insert artwork because they felt that was actually very individual. And if, if this group suggested a certain piece of art for a room, that's fine if they're in there, but, you know, someone would come in and behind them may not like that. So what they said was actually what they wanted was wallpaper in parts of the room because that gave them this opportunity to create an to, to some extent an aesthetic other than with just colour, but didn't force a particular artistic style. So again, we trawled the market both for, for wallpapers that were infection prevention friendly and with different images. And again, these were samples that were sent, they were discussed um, uh, around the table. But at, at the one point we had one of the young people had, would, uh, was at university studying law in Edinburgh and we were sending things up and doing stuff uh, across the internet as well. Uh, 
three teams. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, in a nutshell, that that was the, it's a very quick bounce across the top of a number of the subjects that we that we worked through. There were many others. But when we came, came to the point of drawing this together, it was saying, OK, well, let's talk about these stories. What's happened? What are the things you want? How can we drive uh, the kind of emotional experiences into the plan? What does the colour tell us? Um, you know, the artwork was was really emerging in terms of what they wanted to see. And the picture on the right there is the sort of I kind of put this in because uh, the consultation, particularly with young people, there's always this sort of sense that, you know, leave it to the grown ups and because we know best. But actually, there are places you can go where young children with supervision can drive heavy machinery. And I really kind of thought, well, this is this is kind of that's what I was driving at. I wanted this ability that with supervision. These guys could really, um, really lay down what it is they wanted to see. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, one of them was sitting exams at the time. So I kind of did this sort of spoof thing around an exam question around how do you consult, you know, and you know, option A. Um, which is probably one we're quite familiar with, is where we advance a design some way and then go to a group and say, do you like blue or green? And that can, that's kind of considered to be enough. Whereas actually, you know, option B was what we were driving at, this idea of a very in-depth process where we really got to know each other, really understood each other, um, and had conversations that sometimes weren't easy, um, quite difficult, particularly for me as, as a parent, I have to say. Um, but that's what that's the process we took. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please, we'll start talking about what this unit looked like. Uh, and so this is the point of entry. This is the corridor as you go down the unit. And actually what we've put into the plan here is on the left hand side are the treatment spaces. And these are the spaces the young people said are sort of sparked by this idea of colour. They're kind of jagged. They're very angular. It's not actually it's not always nice going into these places. So let's tell that story. Whereas on the right side, of, as you see this, we've got our timber floor running down. And this floor is the homely floor. It's got curved walls. It's a gentle space. It's where the where the where the where the artwork is. And this leads into the bedrooms. Um, if we can look at the next slide, please, uh, which is looking back the other way, you can see what we did with the artwork is rather than settle on this idea of, uh, of of one one or two kind of key images we because they were so 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 excited by all of these um contextual photographs of the south coast we said well let's make it like a picture postcard and let's make it look like people who've been at the unit have sent postcards in and you have this sense you're not on your own there you're part of this wider thing and and we ran the we ran these postcards down down the wall of the corridor from west to east from Guernsey and Jersey on the far west, as far as Worthing on the right, which is the catchment area um, of, of the unit. It's very interesting that these these these, these uh, photos spark all kinds of conversations before people have even really even gotten into the ward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, we're going to just run through some kind of architectural kind of photos, really. But this is some of the images. This is the kind of jagged side. This is the side where things happen to you uh, as you work down that corridor. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the entrance to the bedrooms. They wanted their timber doors. We let them design the doors. They wanted panel doors. But when we showed them the samples, they said, well, we like all of these samples. So we said, well, let's let's do it. You know, let's 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 not try and be uber cool and about it as we might be as kind of designers let's just let this thing run uh, next slide please um as we go into the bedrooms you can begin to see we're introducing the idea of just different lighting very simple low tech you know a switch on and off but a point but choice and this was the idea um, because this is what you get at home uh, next slide please um the clinical wash hand basin, you know, this is sitting in the room. This is telling you, you know, you don't get that at home. You don't sit and look at that kind of thing at home. Um, so we try to make it as non-clinical as possible uh, by working closely with all of our technical stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing they said they wanted in their bedrooms, they wanted a fireplace. So we gave that to them. No two of these were the same. We designed a graphic around each was different. Um, you can see but it's almost sort of a traditional uh, fireplace mantelpiece, somewhere to pin up your own things uh, above uh, and a desk on the left. You know, many of them were studying or even working uh, and needed space. So, again, this is all within in the bedroom. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, more shots of the bedroom. This idea of harmonising the bedroom, making it feel, giving nooks and crannies, letting people 
bring their own things in and put them in. You know, we kind of, we work ourselves away from this with infection prevention, but actually, is it really that harmful and can it compare with what actually the kind of pleasure it gives back? Uh, next slide, please. Um, what we did in the bedroom is we worked with a furniture designer to produce a settee that you can sleep on because the concept that they wanted was not a put you up bed. They said, we want a sofa and it feels like your mates have come around and slept on the sofa. So this bed is designed, this, this sofa is designed to sleep on, but it's also a sofa. So when no one's there, it's still a sofa. And one of the consultants said to me after, he said, Mark, he said, I consult with my patients differently now. He said, whereas if they were in the bed and I would have to stand at the bed because I'm not allowed to stand at them, sit on the bed rather, I'm stood next to them. It's a very different experience. He said, now we sit side by side on the sofa. He said, and it's a very different clinical experience for him. Um, next slide, please. Um, many of them were, the, the sea and surfing was a thing that was interesting to them. And this is just one of the sort of visitors loo along the corridor, but why not have that you, when the door opens, you get that little snap of kind of interest, of kind of joy, a little memory uh, as you pass by. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the young people in our group had a friend who was a graffiti artist. And so we asked him to join the team and he produced graffiti for us. Uh, there was sort of Banksy-esque kind of feel to it. Um, uh, and we, you know, nothing was kind of left, in, including um, the bathrooms as well. And there was a sort of a homage really there on the top left from you. I get opinion from you. I get the story, another lyric. Um, uh, but actually, this was a message to the young people to say that actually you've given us all of this information. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a social space for parents. Again, this hadn't been done before. Most parents are asked when they need space, have to kind of leave the ward and go elsewhere in the hospital, but we introduced this into the scheme as well. And it's created a space now where interestingly, what's spun from this is a support network because parents sit with other parents going through the same experience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the outpatient space, um, they wanted very much a sports theme. They said, this is the space, you know, where these people are, are coming and going. We want this kind of feel of connecting with the things that you kind of love doing. And again, by, by bringing in artwork, um, we are able to completely change the kind of feel of that space. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the social space, again, our graffiti artist put together um, a couple of pieces of art, one to do with music, one to do with film. Again, every part of the content here, was selected um, by the young people um, in terms of who they wanted to represent them around the kind of jukebox and in the musical theme. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the pool table, various other imagery, you know, the kind of clocks, the furniture, all of this was brought together um, from all of the work that we've been doing over that year in the, in the, in the sort of pizza uh, huts that we'd kind of been in. Um, next slide, please. And this idea about watching TV, is it a TV for watching films? Is it for gaming? Actually, we 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 did both. So we, what was it in the design? I put this freestanding wall in the middle and the next slide where you'll be able to see that what that does is it, um, it divides the space. Uh, you can see these panoramic shots that you've got gaming happening on one side and films and TV uh, kind of watching on the other. Uh, and uh, that allowed both of those activities to take place uh, at the same time uh, and make the space. The, the, the feel of this space was very much the student common room of the bar, maybe, maybe, maybe your kind of big living space at home. This was what they were kind of driving at, the space they were after, because it's got a kitchen, it's got a kitchen table in there as well. You can put an oven in to allow them to kind of cook and have, have uh, cook their own pizza, interestingly. Um, next slide, please. All of this didn't fit. Um, so what we had to do was stick it out of the building. Um, so we did exactly that. We said, look, you guys, everything you've asked for doesn't fit. That doesn't matter. Um, we're going to extend the building so we can to leave it out um, around. Uh, and the next slide you'll see um, that we used a kind of a cladding panel um, that changed colour as the sun moved around, kind of reflecting. So you can see on the right of the image there, it's kind of purpley blue and to the left it's green. And that changes literally as you walk past the building or the sun moves around the building. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is the design team. This is the group of young people I, I worked with. You can see myself and Abby nestling almost seamlessly into a group of people half our own age. Um, you might spot on the right there the two chaps uh, who were very similar. They were twins. Uh, one of them had cancer, the other didn't, but they went through the journey together and they went through the journey with 
with us. And this is the group of young people, some of whom I'm still in touch with today. I've been able to, uh, some of them have been interested in their career in construction following their involvement in this. Uh, and Nick, the chap sat down, I still speak to um, from time to time as he's developed his, his working career. And there's one final slide I just want to uh, put up, if I may. Um, and I'm going to leave you with um, just a couple of stories. One, one was that when the uh, unit was opened, it was televised, I was at home, I saw an interview with one of the young ladies um, who was first in the unit. And they said, well, you know, what's it like? And she said, well, she said, today, she said, I've been in the shower um, listening to my own music through the speaker in the shower dancing with cancer. And she said, that shouldn't happen. And I thought to myself, well, it just did. And then, and, the, and the last story, really, <clears throat> which is quite kind of a sort of a tough one to share in some ways, but um, is that on visiting the ward many months later, I bumped into one of the patients I recognised. She was at the craft table making something. It was a card. We had a brief chat and I kind of walked away. And the key worker found me after and took me to one side and said that Mark should be this young lady, she was making a card because she'd made a good friend in the unit, but unfortunately her friend was end of life and sadly passed away and it was a card for her family. And she said, you should know that um, she was given the opportunity of where she wanted to spend her final hours uh, and whether that would be at home or whether that be in the unit. And she said she felt so secure and safe in the unit that that's what she opted to do. Um, I don't think I'll get an accolade like that in my career elsewhere. So thank you, uh, Helen, back to you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk through this subject. I very much enjoyed doing it. Thank you. Care went into that unit. I mean, I think that was a really inspiring keynote. So massive thanks to Mark. And if you've got any questions for him, then do please get in touch with the NH NHE events team and they'll forward your questions on. It is time for lunch now. And let's meet back for our next session on build diversity within the NHS estate, which Mark set us up very well for after a well deserved break. So uh, see you back here at two o'clock. That was an amazing keynote.